So with a, with a computer system, we'd like to be able to control what different users can do on that computer system. That's what access control does. Prevent unauthorized use of resources. Where the resources, the resources may be files, may be uh, physical resources like disks, CPU, uh, part of files, processors, so typical things that are the resources of any computer or computer system. For access control to work, we rely on some authentication mechanism because the access control is usually specified per user. And so we assume that the users of the computer system have already been authenticated. They've somehow logged in and we've checked that they are the correct user. And then the access control mechanisms depend upon that user identity. We often specify this user can do these things. The other things we need to do is be able to um, have some way to, to set up the access control to say who can do what, and that's some authorization function. Sometimes we'll just have a database that specifies who's authorized to do what. And often we want to be able to check that our access control is doing what we expect it to do, to perform some audit. And there are three main policies for access control, discretionary, mandatory, and role-based. And we briefly introduced discretionary last, last lecture. Uh, we'll go through the others and quite quick just talk about the differences between them and give a, a couple of examples. They can be combined, that is concepts from each can be combined in a particular computer system. They're not mutually exclusive. Let's look at well, again, we talk generally about subjects, the users, objects, the resources, the things we want to control access to, and for which users, which subjects, and we usually give subjects some access right, some right to use some object, or a permission. You have permission to execute this file. So the subject has some access right on some object. That's the general terminology. The subject's often classified, uh, and there are different classifications. One we'll see in an example is, OK, we can talk about owners, groups of users, the world, meaning all users on a computer system. And there are other classifications. Okay, it doesn't have to be these three. Many different types of objects. And access rights, there may be different ones, depending upon our computer system. They're, they're not fixed. So discretionary access control, some entity is, ac is granted access rights. And the discretionary part is that we're allowed to modify these access rights. We're, it's up to the discretion of the owner as to who we can access or who we can uh, permit to access a particular resource. So we can modify them. We have some discretion there. And it's commonly used in operating systems and in database management systems. So databases and, and many operating systems use discretionary, discretionary access control. But they can be extended to use the others that we'll talk about. The way to specify who can do what the, the general form is a matrix. We have a set of resources or objects. We have a set of users or subjects. And then we form a matrix. And then in the elements of that matrix, we specify what the subject can do with what resource. So we specify the permission or the access right inside the element of each of the matrix. So we can think of it as a matrix. And that's what this example does. And a very simple example, we have four files, three subjects, and we specify the access rights in the elements of those matri that matrix. Wrong way. Of course, imagine we have many, many files, many objects, and many users. Not all users 
can access all files. There may be some empty element. So in this case, user C can't do anything with file 3. Imagine there are 100,000 files on our computer system. Then maybe user C cannot do anything with most of those files. So we'd have empty elements in the matrix. So even though the matrix captures our access control, we to store that information on a computer system, we'll often use other data structures. So this information must be stored somewhere. Because this is stored, say, in the operating system. And then when a user wants to access a particular object, the operating system must check what access rights that user has. So it looks up in the matrix. And if the user B tries to open file 3, it checks the permissions in the matrix. So this data is stored somewhere. So it can be stored as a matrix, but because the matrix will be quite large in some cases and have many empty elements, there are more efficient ways to store them. And the next three slides shows uh, three main approaches. Access control lists, lists for each object or each file in this example, what the users can do. So we see this is the same case as the previous slide. The same data is stored, but just in a different data structure. This is a set of, think of linked lists. For each file, user A has these access rights on that file. Ownership, read, write. And that matches here. File 1, user A, own, read, write. So it's the same information, just stored in a different way. And as we have, so currently we have three users can access file one. If there's a fourth user on the system added, <coughs> user D, and they also have access rights on file one, then we can add a new element into this list. So for each file, think we have a linked list specifying the access rights. It's just a, a data structure to store this information conveniently on, on our computer system. And we do it for each file. So that's a set of access control lists control who can access each resource. Of course, you need less space to store this compared to a matrix, because a matrix has many empty elements, whereas that information is not stored. For example, file 3, user C cannot access file 3. File 3, there's no entry for user C. We don't need to store anything here. That's the idea. Capability lists are the other way around, where we store per user. User A has these capabilities on these resources. User B has capabilities on these resources. So it's the same information, just stored in a different manner. And again, it depends upon your computer system as to which one to choose. So we'll see an example that operating systems will often use access control lists. For each file on your operating system, the, the access rights are specified. And a third way is a table, just lists all those values. Okay, the subject, the mode in which you can access that object. So it's the same information again, but in a different data structure, just a, a table. And this is useful, for example, to, in a database. Let's say you need to create a database that controls access to different resources, then store it in a table where your database has a set of uh, three columns specifying who, the subject, the permission or access right, here listed the access mode, and the object. And now the database, whenever a user tries to access some object, the database first checks in this authorization table. Checks if user B is trying to write to file 4, User B, what can user B do on file 4? They can only read. So the authorization table is checked and the system can check that user B cannot write to file 4. So three different ways to store this access control information in a more convenient manner. Databases often use this approach. We'll see uh, capability lists may be used uh, in some web systems. We'll see an example, access control lists often, often in uh, operating systems, but they don't have to be. It depends upon the computer system. 
And that's what those three examples capture this information here. We talk about in practice we have access control lists and capability lists and we could have an authorization table for a database especially. I'll show you, I'll come back at the end of this topic and show you a more detailed example and I think most of you know it. Uh, if you took my lab yesterday then you know about the access control in Linux and you get more chance to explore that is in a small homework task in, in your virtual network to, to look at access control. So I'll give you a, a few examples of this one after I go through the other two. Role-based access control. Instead of looking at individual users of your computer system, allocate users to, to particular roles in the computer system. So users are assigned roles. And then access rights are assigned to roles. They can be assigned in the same way. We'll see that we can have a matrix or a particular table or list to, to map the access rights to roles. But in this case, each user on the computer system is assigned to some role. And roles in practice are usually related to some job function. Okay, so if it, for an organization, the role may be faculty member, student, head of school, or uh, accountant, um, HR staff, um, CEO. Okay, so you can think of the roles being assigned to job functions and then particular users take on those roles. Uh, we can implement similar using groups of users but there's some s subtle differences that is in, in discretionary access control we listed for uh, okay we have users access, give access rights we'll see when we look at the Linux file system and access control in Linux that we can also say a group of users okay that is the group of users the group of student users includes A and B and give permissions based upon groups. So we can do that in, in Linux or Unix based operating systems. Role based is, there's some similarities there. We can implement the similar features using groups but we'll see there are some more details with role based that we normally cannot do with just groups in, in a Linux system. We'll see in a few slides. Users may be assigned multiple roles. Okay, so a particular user may have multiple roles. Uh, it may be static in that okay, it's fixed assignment. Uh, or the roles may change. So a user may change roles. Usually a session is defined as some assignment of a user to a role. That is, when I log into a system, some, uh, I log into a web-based system, then I'll often take on a particular role when I log in. I may change roles when I'm logged in, which effectively creates a different session. So different things, different access rights are permitted when I change roles. And similar to discretionary access control, the, we can have a matrix that maps the roles to the access rights on particular objects like this one. First we map users to roles. Okay, so the user 1 can take role 1, user 2 can take role 1, user 3 can take roles 2 or 4. So we map users to roles. For example, we need some way to specify that uh, the faculty members, maybe role 1, faculty member and then map the actual usernames or user identities to the, those who can be act as the role faculty member. Okay. And then the permissions are assigned per, where have we got a role here, on the vertical axis here. These are the roles and these are the objects. Note that the, this example from the textbook uses some different notation here. Uh, what has it got? R, F, P and D, I think. Um, F refers to a file, P refers to a process, D re refers to a disk, R maybe just a general resource, I can't remember. But again, these are objects. 
Our objects don't have to be files. I can control who can access a particular software process running on my computer, or who can access a disk, a physical hard disk. So we can have different types of objects. So in this case, our roles are mapped to the objects given different access rights. And we see some different examples on, for example, on a disk, disk one, role one, then we can do different operations on that disk. So we have different uh, access rights, like to, to seek or to search through the disk, to be the owner of the disk. Uh, similar on files, read, write, and execute. But these are just examples of access rights. We may have other ones specific to our computer system. So similar to discretionary, we have this matrix mapping objects, not to users, but to roles. That's similar as before. And a second matrix that maps users to roles. It becomes a little bit easier to manage in an organization because in most organizations, the policy would specify that access rights are related to roles. Okay? It doesn't necessarily matter about the individual user. So therefore, you don't have to care about who the user is when you specify this matrix. You just say, all faculty members have these permissions. All students have these permissions. Or all accountants in the organization have this, these permissions. And then separately manage who is the accountant or the set of accountants. So that's similar, except one, this is more suited to easy management when we have uh, well-defined job positions or roles in the organization. It can be more complex. We don't necessarily just have a single mapping of one user to one role. They can have multiple roles. One role can have multiple users. And we can start to have hierarchies to rep hierarchies in the roles that reflect the, the typical structure of organizations. Uh, so some organization which has a director, some project leaders, uh, and on each project there may be some engineers of different, um, take different roles in those projects. And then we can start to assign permissions to the different roles. And also we can do things like, okay, the project lead has, as a role, has some permissions. The two engineer or the engineers on that project have a set of permissions based on that role. And since there's a hierarchy in that the project leader is the boss of the project, they may inherit the, the permissions of the engineers. That is, what we can do is say that production engineer has these access rights, quality engineer has these access rights, the project lead automatically inherits those access rights because they are the higher level in the hierarchy. So we can start to map the access rights and access control back to how the the organization is often structured. So it can get more complex, and that starts to get more complex than what you normally do with groups in Linux file systems. A very simple example. Uh, in the Moodle web-based system that we use, it has a very basic role-based access control in that this is one part of the admin interface of the Moodle website. And you can think that, or we'll see, that it has a set of what it lists capabilities that you can do on the website. Things you can do on the website like take quizzes, view lecture notes, add new users. So the many different operations that you can do. And then it specifies which roles have those permissions. So think of these as the access rights, the things we're allowed to do. This is the set of roles that have those access rights. So the manager can do this. The lecturer and the manager can do this. And who is the manager? Who is the lecturer? Well, then we have a separate, separate database that assigns individual users, like myself, to be the lecturer, or uh, another faculty member to be a lecturer, and if we scroll down, we may see some students. Uh, okay, a student 
can unenroll themselves from a course. Okay, because it's only students that are enrolled in course, so they have the, the capability to unenroll themselves from the course. Uh, so this is role based, where student really encompasses the, the set of students related to a particular course. A very simple example of a role based access control. The mapping of roles to users is not shown here. It's in a, a different page or a different uh, part of the website. Note that the objects and the resources are not just files. So these is, this is not saying that these users can access files. It's to perform operations on p different bit sets of data. The website is really just a database containing quiz questions, containing student information. And this column shows the access rights that we have on those different pieces of data. So it's not always just files that are the resources. One last slide on role-based access control. The other thing that we can have sometimes is constraints. We can start to define, once we have a set of roles, some relationship between those roles. For example, this hierarchy of roles. A higher role can include the access rights of all lower role. So the CEO automatically inherits the, the access rights of all the other employees of the organisation. We can quite do that. We can do that quite easily in role-based systems. In a discretionary-based system, it's more complex to do that to set that up and manage it. Uh, you can have mutually exclusive roles, so a user can only be assigned to one particular role in some set. So, a what's an example? A user, can, if they are assigned to be a, uh, what's an example that's mutually exclusive? If they're assigned to be a student, they cannot be a faculty member. Okay, all right, that's commonly the case, not always the case, but that may be a condition. That is, if a student is in the role, uh, if a particular person is assigned to the role of student, then they cannot be otherwise assigned to the role of faculty member that may be a constraint from our organisation perspective and we can implement that constraint in a role based access control system. So it usually provides easier mechanisms to represent the policies of an organisation in the implementation in the computer system. We can do things like mac put limits, the maximum number of users assigned to a role. Uh, so. Uh, maybe the, the administrator for a particular server, we, we have some policy that we, we must have two users and no more than two users, exactly two users. So we can have implement limits in the role-based access control system to make sure that policy is met, that we always have two users assigned to that role, no more. And we can have implement prerequisites in the way that users are assign, assigned to roles. So an example is that a user can be only assigned to a senior role if they previously had a junior role. Let's say some organisations have junior engineer, senior engineer. So a user to be assigned to the senior engineer role must have previously been in the junior engineer role. That may be the policy of the organisation and we can implement that in the role based access control system. So there are different constraints and this makes it more complex and more suited to organisational structures than simple discretionary access control. So two different approaches so far. One more we'll go through and then we'll come back to discretionary with one example. Last one, mandatory access control. In both of these cases, role based and discretionary, we can usually change the access control someone has permissions to modify the access rights. Someone has permissions to assign this user to this role. Mandatory access control is usually fixed or more static. And it's based on the concept of multi-level security. 
And the best example, if you think about uh, a military uh, situation where you, or a, a, a security organisation where you, you know that there may be different classifications of, of documents or information. And one classification you may see is, okay, we can talk about top secret, secret, confidential, restricted and unclassified is a common classification of uh, military information or, or security organisation information for governments where unclassified information is the lowest level, more important information is classified as restricted and then confidential, secret and top secret. So we say that top secret is of course more secret than confidential information. So often some organisations use such classification. We can implement that in an access control system. The idea is that we have a, a subject gets a security clearance at one of the levels. These are just example levels, the ones listed here. There are other classifications. In general, there can be any classification. But this is an example I think many, uh, you'll recognise some parts of it. So a subject, a user, has some clearance. So the u I may have a clearance of confidential. And then objects are given a classification. So this file on the system has a classification of top secret. I have a clearance of confidential. The file has a classification of top secret. Can I access the file? No. The way that multi-level security and mandatory access control says that you cannot access or read a file or re access an object which has a higher level classification than your clearance level. And that's what the, well, the first property specifies here for mandatory access control. A subject can only read an object of less or equal security level. So a subject which has clearance of confidential can only read objects, can only view objects that are confidential, restricted or unclassified. That is, objects which are the same or lower classification level. No read up, that's summarised as. You cannot read an object that is, has a higher level than you are. You cannot read up. So that's the common requirement of a mandatory access control system. The other one, which is not so obvious, but is also necessary, is no write down. A subject can only write into an object of greater or equal security level. So if we think of, say, an, a file as an object, reading is being able to see the contents, writing being able to modify the contents, including delete. What's the, the second one, no write down mean? Why do we need that? So no read up means that you cannot read anything at a higher level of classification than you are. No write down means if I have clearance of confidential, no read up means I can read confidential, restricted and unclassified objects. I cannot read secret or top secret objects. That's no read up. No write down means if I'm classified, um, cleared at confidential, I cannot write into objects lower. That is restricted or unclassified. Why is that? Why do we need this one? Yeah, for, yeah first, yeah. Protect the file from how? You not modify without authorization. Why? Why do we want to restrict this? Yeah. Yeah, we don't want the 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 file to be exposed or released to a lower level. So I have confidential clearance. Okay. The ability to write means, let's say, I can take confidential information, a file which is classified as confidential, if I can write it into an object which is classified as restricted, then I've released that confidential information into a lower level. And then someone who's classified as 
or cleared as restricted, can read that previously confidential information. So this is this to stop the release of higher classified information down to lower levels. We cannot write down. So that's also required. So if I'm cleared as secret, I can read secret and everything below information. Even though I can read secret information, I'm not allowed to write that into an object which is in the confidential or lower clearance. So if there's a file that's classified as confidential and another one is secret, I can read the secret file but I cannot write to the confidential file because that will allow me to release that secret to people who are classified as confidential, which would be uh, against the, the requirements of our mandatory access control. So that one's a little bit non-obvious, but necessary. Any questions so far? So all objects must be classified and all users must be cleared for this system to work. If you don't have a clearance, then okay, then you're down here, the lowest level, less than unclassified. Or you get a default clearance. And all objects uh, must be cla classified. And usually there's some administrator that must do that or some process for doing that. And the users cannot change this policy. So there's no discretion to make changes as to what you can do. That's fixed by the administrator of the system. All right, if something needs to be changed, that if, a, if an object for some reason needs to be changed from confidential down to restricted, there must be a, a set procedure for how to do that. And it's up to the administrator. The, the users, the normal users, cannot make those changes. So that's mandatory access control, or concept at least. It's much more stricter in the requirements than the other two. And therefore often used when we need a higher level of security in our computer system. There are different implementations of it, uh, but that's I think all we need to go through today on, on mandatory access control. Just introduce the concept. Uh, many operating systems use discretionary access control, but often there are extensions. You can add some extension to the operating system to support uh, mandatory access control if you want a more secure operating system. So some lists of some extensions to support mandatory access control for Linux, uh, for BSD, uh, Windows has mandatory integrity control which effectively adds this capability to the operating system. Used in in organizations that need this high level of security. Uh, and that's all we want to cover on the concepts of access control. We'll go through one more example, but uh, any questions before we go to that example? Yep. Role based access control. Uh, so users may be assigned multiple roles. Uh, it may be fixed by the administrator. So we can think there's always an administrator of the system, someone who sets it up. Uh, if we just quickly go back uh, in our picture, we have some administrator who has the, the job of setting up this access control system and specifying the rights. With a role-based access control, that can be static. The users are assigned to roles. But the system may be set up such that users within the system, users within the system may change the roles for other users. The administrator assigns the roles, option one, or the system is set up so that users can assign roles to other users. Where are we? The CEO. So there's an administrator who set up the computer system there's the role of CEO, the boss of the company. Maybe they have the permission to assign roles to other users. 
and to modify the system. So some dynamic changes while the system is operating. So maybe I have the role of faculty member. As a permission of that role, I can change a student from the normal student user to be a teaching assistant role. So I can change the roles of users. Uh, the admin role usually has all permissions. They control the system. They can do anything they like. Uh, the, other, the roles defined in the system are often restrictive. If we go back to one of our principles, I think it's listed, the principle of least privilege we use in all these cases is that you give the permissions, you give minimum per permissions such that they can do their job. Does the CEO need the permission to assign roles to other users? Probably not. They can still do their job without that. Does a, a faculty member need the permission to um, assign roles for students? Maybe for their course, but maybe not. Maybe it's the job of someone else to do that. So the, this principle of least privilege is that give the least amount of privileges such that they can do their job. Don't give them more. Don't give them all privileges. Just because they're the faculty member, don't give them the entire access to the system. That's the idea there. So that is related to your question about, well, what's the difference between an admin and a faculty member? A faculty member usually would have much, uh, much fewer privileges than the admin. The admin has everything. The faculty member has a subset. The faculty member doesn't need privileges to do things in accounting, the accounting department. Any other questions before we look at uh, a Linux example, which should be familiar to most of you? So just the concepts of what do we mean by access control and three different alternatives. Quite easy. Let's look at a simple example of access control, discretionary access control, and a typical Unix-based operating system. And we'll use Linux as an example. And we'll look at this approach, where we have a set of files on a file system. And those files, there's some record in the file system that uh, specifies which users on the system can access and do what with those files, what access rights they have. And this will be boring for some of you because you took the lab yesterday and you learnt it already, so you know it. But there's a few people that haven't, so let's go through it. Uh, let's bring up the lectures. So this is available on the website, and I think pretty sure you have it in front of you, file permissions. So let's use Linux as an example for discretionary access control. A few slides and then a, a demo. So most operating systems today are multi-user systems. Multiple users can access the computer that that operating system is running on. Uh, Linux systems are commonly used in this case. Uh, one example you know of is that there's the ICT server in SIT. That's one computer running one operating system. There are multiple users of that computer. You are all users because, in fact, your account on Moodle is linked to your account on that Linux that Linux operating system. Okay, so it's actually the same account. So we need to, we're going to use Linux as an example in this case. Um, some reasons why there. First, to understand how access control works, we need to know something about how the file system is organized. So we have a hard disk with a bunch of files, but how is that, how does the operating system keep track of those files? Most of the things, the concepts we talk about, can be applied to other operating systems. The file system organization in Linux, first there's some hierarchy of files. And you can explore this because you all have your own virtual node that you use from the first homework and you'll give it a chance in your second homework to explore the file system and set up some access control system. This is an example of the Linux file system where we have a root directory 
denoted as a forward slash. And then we may have subdirectories, which have subdirectories and so on. And we have files in those directories. So we have two types of objects, directories and files. And this applies to many operating systems. They differ slightly on the, the hierarchy here and the names of the directories. And this one's not complete, but it's just an example that often we'll have under the root directory a home directory. And the users of that computer system will have their directories under that home directory. So S. Gordon, one user, has a directory in that home directory and other users as well. It's not mandatory, but it's common. Uh, BIN usually refer, is short for binaries, programs, applications. So most applications of your operating system are stored in these BIN directories, binary directories. There's slash BIN, but there are others. Uh, user slash BIN, another set of binaries. And there's some definitions of what the expected applications will be stored in here and what ones would be stored in here. The required ones for the base of the operating system here some additional applications here. Not so important for this. But we have files and directories. That lists and describes some of those base directories, like the home directory, libraries. If you come from the Windows background, the libraries are usually DLLs. Right? They used to be the dynamic linked libraries. So they are uh, object code that's linked from other, or that multiple applications may link to. So libraries which are shared between different binaries or applications. Um, yeah, you can have a look at that. Not so necessary for today. Now, so we have files and directories. Our file system keeps track of them. So we actually have some software and some, effectively some database that keeps track of all of them. And the relationship when you create a new file, where is it? And you create a new directory, how is it related to other directories? And in Unix or Linux-based systems, we use the concept of inodes. Think of them as some data structure for storing information about the file or directory. So it's a data structure that stores the important information about a file or directory. Sorry. Some of that information is listed here. The owner of the file or directory, so a user on that computer system is specified as the owner of that file. The size, some timestamps, like when it was created, when it was last modified, so we may have different timestamps. When was it last accessed? So we can think usually with files. We create a file on this time. Then we modify the file, so we usually will keep track of that. Uh, someone may read the file, not modify it, but just access the file. So we often keep track of that as well. So different timestamps are stored. The mode, think of the access rights. We'll come to that in a moment, but one part of the mode of the file is the access rights for that file. And that's what we want to get to. So this is the data structure for each file or directory, and then pointers to the data blocks which contain the actual file. So say a one megabyte file may be split across multiple data blocks. The inode has a set of pointers to each of those data blocks. So that's the basic way that the file, sy file system keeps track of the, the files and directories. And the operating system maintains a list of inodes in our inode table. So the OS has this list of inodes each inode is for each file or directory. Directory is a special case of a file, really. So a directory is really treated as a file. It has its own inode. There are a file that lists the entry for each file in that directory. So if we have a directory home, no, not home, a directory ABC, and there are three files in it, then the file we'll see really points to the directory is a file that points to those files inside that directory. So a, a directory has an inode and it points 
to the other inodes or entries for other files in that directory. And the way that it points to them is it keeps track of the inode number of the file, the length of the file name, and the name of the file. Uh, and we draw that. Thought I had a picture. Let's try and draw it. Just briefly, or summary of that concept of a directory. Uh, we have some directory um, That's the directory. The directory is ABC. It's a subdirectory of the Steve directory, which is subdirectory of the home directory. So there's our directory. We can think that there's an inode for this directory. For the directory ABC. And it contains the mode, the permissions on that directory. Uh, what else do we have? The owner, the size, the timestamps, those values listed. Same as a file. Maybe other information. And then think of this directory as, I'll, just, I'll come back to that. A file has pointers to data blocks. A directory is just a file which lists the entries inside that directory. So our, our inode for the directory ABC has pointers to data blocks, and those data blocks list entries of the files inside our directory. So let's create some. Let's say we have inside here, we have file1.txt and file2.txt. Two files inside this directory. Then the pointers would link to entries about those files. So for file 1, and another pointer to file2.txt. Not to the actual file, but to information about those files. In particular, for each of those, there'll be an inode number, inode number, the length of the file name, and this is on the previous slide, and the name of the file, the file name. That is, the directory ABC, think of it as a file. Inside that file, as for this file, file1.txt is an inode number. The length of this file name, which is six characters, not the length of the file, the length of the file name, and the actual file name itself, f1.txt. So that's stored in there. And then same for the next file. So that's what a directory is. Again, maybe I'm going a bit too much out of scope here. Um, but directories are treated like files. But really think of them as files that point to other files. The important point is that a directory has the same, will have the same set of permissions that we can do on a file. The same mode, owner, size, and timestamps. So the size of the directory is equal to five or only zero? The size of the directory is the size of this directory file. So the, the directory, think, is a file that stores information about what's inside this directory. So it's the size of this information. It's not the size of the files in that directory. They're just pointers. If you don't follow that, then you'll survive. That's okay. 
it's not so relevant for what we're going to discuss. But remember, files and directories, we'll see they both have what we call a mode. The mode we'll see is the permissions on that file or directory. They also have an owner information. So more details about those contents. Each inode, a mode, 16 bits. So there are 16 bits. 12 bits are related to permissions. And we'll look at those in detail. Four bits about the file type. Is this file a, a normal file, a regular file? Is this file really a directory? From an inode perspective, they're all files, but there are different types. A normal file, a directory, and there are some special cases as well, some special types of files. So there's others. The inode contains the owner information, which includes the user that owns the file, some ID of the user, the group that owns the file. So in fact, we have two sets of ownership, a user owner and a group owner. The size of the file in bytes and some timestamps. And we access time, creation time, and or change time and change, I thought creation. I'll check that one. And modification time, M time. There are other fields. These are the common ones, the main ones. We want to get to the permissions and see for a file what permissions can a user have. And that's about our access control. Permissions and users. We can talk about for any file, and when I say file it includes a directory now, because from the file system perspective a directory is a special type of file. So any file we can have read, write and execute permissions. They're our access rights. And we can talk about a categories or categories of users. And in it, we have the user that owns the file, the users in the file group. So for each file, we have an owner and a group. And then all other users, those that are not the owner and not in the file group, they're the other users. And sometimes we refer to all users on the computer system. All users. And we'll use these letters to abbreviate these concepts. With respect to a real file, a regular file, those access rights, read, write and execute. Read means you can see the contents of the file. Write means you can change the contents of the file. Execute means you can execute that file which is really relevant if it's a, a binary application or a script. So we can execute some files. With respect to directories, those permissions, read means you can see the contents of the directory. You can list the contents of the directory. Write, you can create or remove files from that directory. You can add a new file inside the directory or we can delete a file from inside that directory. And execute of a directory means you can access files in the directory. So you will see that directories and files are related so that in some directory you need the X permission on that directory to be able to access files inside it. Access includes read and write files inside it. So it becomes quite complex when you start con consider permissions of files and directories. We'll come back to the special bits in a moment. And an example. Uh, so in the inode there are 12 bits which are protection bits. The first nine bits indicate those three permissions, read, write or execute for each of those three sets of users. The user, the group and others. And of the 12 bits, there are another three bits which specify some special permissions which we'll return to if necessary later. And on a uh, on a 
Linux system, we often see this information summarized in the output of LS and other programs. Let's create a file. I have a directory here. Inside this directory, we have one file and three subdirectories in this example. How do I know it's a file and three subdirectories? The first character here indicates the file type. And remember the two, a directory is a file type. So directory D, no D here indicates that it's a file. And then these next nine characters are about our permissions for those entities, those objects in our access control system. And they come in groups of three, 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 three. We'll go back to the slide to explain them. So looking here in the example, we say the first character indicates the file type. If it's a dash, it's a normal file. If it's a D, it's a directory. The next, then we have a group, a, a set of three characters. The first three identify the permissions for the user owner of the file. The next three for the group associated with the file. And the last three were all other users on the computer. So we've got three sets of users. The owner, the group owner, and others, the rest of the world. And the way that we interpret this output of LS is that if there's an R here in the first character, it means that entity can read the file. If there's a W, then they can write to the file. If the third character, and it's not in this example, if it's an X, then they'll be able to execute the file. If there's no character there, there's a dash, it means they don't have that particular permission. And it's always RWX, RWX, RWX. So if the letter's not shown, you know they don't have that particular permission or access right. So in this example, the user can read the file, the user can write the file, the user cannot execute the file because there's no X here. The group associated with this file, that is any user in the group associated with this file, can read the file. They cannot write or execute the file. Any other user on the computer system cannot either read, write or execute that file. So that's how we capture those permissions with typical applications like LS. It's actually stored in a set of uh, bits by the operating system in the inode. Those permissions as bits either on or off, read and write on. So nine bits correspond to these nine values here. There are three other bits that indicate special permissions, but they're not shown in the output of LS. They are there, but just not shown by this program. Any questions? Again, a lot of you know this, though, but there's a few who haven't seen this before, so any questions? So you should be able to answer questions about, uh, in the exam, about given some setup of this file system, what can different users do? Okay, so Again, this is just one way to implement the, the access control matrix. The matrix is a set of users, a set of objects, and the permissions those users have on those objects. And it's just stored in a, in a, a different way here. Going back, what do we miss? So, permissions, read, write, execute, apply to either files or directories. Three sets of users, the owner, the group, and others. And one that captures all of them, all users. There are some special permissions. And here it gets a bit more complex. Uh, with respect to files, when you execute a file, 
when you run a program, for example, run an application, you execute a file, the owner of the process that's executing that file can be set. So if I'm user Steve and I execute a file which is owned by uh, user John, then normally the process is owned by user John, even though I started it. But we can modify that and there's some, a bit to indicate that the process that we run when we execute a file is set to that of the, the particular file. It's called the set user ID bit. So this is related to executing files. I see blank faces and complex things, so I think we'll not go through this today. We'll, uh, uh, we'll not explain it much more today. We'll focus on the easier parts. Um, we will not see it in many cases. If you want to explore how these extra special permissions, uh, I can maybe explain to you in another setting. Let's skip over them. Go straight to a demo. So, I'm logged in as the user Steve on my node, my virtual node here. I have some files. Uh, let's log in as another user, switch to a different user who already has an account on this computer system. Uh, so I'll pretend to be this other user. I know his password. He's got a very weak password. Uh, so I'm logged in as this other user and Let's clear this and go back. Where am I? I'm in his home directory. What's in here? There's nothing in here. Okay? Uh, there's no files in his home directory. There's nothing created yet. So his home directory and there's nothing in here. But there are other users on this system. And what can this user do with, res with respect to accessing the files of other users? Let's try. Let's go into the home directory and see that there are other users on the system and let's try and access some of them. So let's access something in Steve's directory. What's there? Well, in Steve's directory there's three subdirectories as we saw before in a file. What can our user do on the first directory? What can Tanawit do on the directory lectures here? You may have to guess something, but... Uh, he may read, write, and execute. He may read, write, and execute. Why? Because he may be in the group of faculty. He is in the group of faculty. Do you think so? Uh, sure. Are you in the group? Are you a faculty member? Well, let's check. Okay, so first point. Our user... Let's look at the permissions. First we know it's a directory because it's D here. The first three permissions, RWX, mean for the owner of this file. And the owner of this file, the user owner, is specified here. The owner of this file, and again I say file for the general meaning, it includes a directory, is Steve. Steve has read, write and execute permissions. The group owner of this file is faculty. Anyone in the faculty group has read, write, execute permissions. Other users have no permissions. That's the last three characters here. So other users have no permissions. So Tanawit is not the, the user owner. Is he in the faculty group? Well, I hope not. Uh, but we can check. There's a file that keeps track of those things. Um, an easy way to check though, the groups that he is in, his own group and the students group. He is not in the faculty's group. So groups just lists the set of groups that this user is currently in. He is in his own group and he's in a group called students. He's not in the faculty group. Therefore, with respect to this directory, he's considered an other user. He has no permissions. Let's check. We try to change into that directory. We cannot. Permission denied. We try to ls. So change into the directory to access the directory. 
ls to list the contents cannot uh, make a file in that directory, so write to the directory. Cannot. So cd is trying to access the directory. ls is listing the contents of the directory. touch is just a way to create a file. touch, my new file inside this directory, is trying to write to the directory. So this is testing, can I write to the directory? ls is testing, can I read the directory? cd is testing, can I access the directory? And they are the three permissions. And I've got them in the wrong order, but cd is x. On a directory, the ability to execute is to access. There's no x permission on this directory, he cannot access. There's no r permission, he cannot read, or ls. There's no W uh, permissions, so he cannot create a new file in that directory, as we'd expect. He can't do anything in that directory. What about shared files? What can he do? So again, we check the owner is Steve, the group owner is Steve, we know our user is not in that group, so we, he's an other user from that perspective, and the permissions for other users, read and execute. So, of the three operations, cd, ls, and create a file using touch, which ones can he do? CD and LS. Let's try. LS, what are we? Shared files. All right, there's nothing in there. It, it worked, not a good example, but it didn't return permission denied. So he, he can do that. It's just that there's nothing in there to, to see. Uh, LS works. CD, yep, okay, we can change into it. LS, there's nothing there. Go back actually cd into that directory and let's create a new file. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Permission denied. I cannot write to this directory. I don't have the right permissions on this directory. Sorry. Maybe. There we go. So permission denied when I try to create a new file using touch. I cannot write to the directory. Uh, another example. Let's log out. And I'll log in as a different user. And I've guessed his password too. But it's hard. I forgot it. Note, here's a, a password protection mechanism. S user switches user and it prompts for the password for that user. So I press enter, I type in the password, and I press enter now. It takes several seconds to respond. Now, I'll try with the correct password. And I press enter now, immediately responds. My computer's not that slow that it takes a long time to respond. There's a deliberate delay put in there when you enter a, a wrong password. And that's common with many systems. If you enter the wrong password, the system checks almost immediately, in a matter of milliseconds, and then it adds a delay so you cannot do a brute force attack and quickly repeat trying many passwords. So there's a delay in the response if there's a failure for the password. So this is a way to slow down the attempts to try different passwords. So that's from our previous topic. What can Tanarak do? Well, he is a member of the faculty group. So what can he do in the lectures directory? In the lectures directory, which is owned by the faculty group, 
which our user is a member of, we have read, write, and execute permissions. So the Tanarak can change into the lectures directory, can ls, and I'll just clear so it's up the top, can ls inside this directory. It's not his directory, but he's a member of the group that has permissions on the directory. He can open the file in a text editor and change it, add some words, and save, and the file has changed. So he can modify files inside that directory. Uh, can he delete this file? If you can modify the contents, you can effectively delete it. One way to delete a file is to open it in an editor and delete all the contents and save it. Okay, so yes, you can delete the file. And you can create new files. Hello. Okay, so he has permissions to... What did I do here? What did I... Sorry, I made a mistake. Shouldn't have been touch, it should have been echo. The commands I'm using here are not so important, echo and touch, just the concept. Can we edit, read, and execute files and directories? That's the importance here. Okay, so some examples of the file system. Your next homework will have you using your virtual node, create some accounts. I'll give you some instructions for how to create accounts and use some of these commands just to explore uh, and set up the permissions to meet some particular requirements. So what we need to start with is a, is a policy for the organization. For this computer system, these users should be allowed to do these things. And then you, as the IT person, must implement that policy using the file access control system. Questions? Um, can a file have a mul can have multiple group owners? In in the basic way, no. The 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 inode stores the one user owner and one group owner. So no, there's one group and one user associated with each file. I think there may be extensions of, of the fi different file systems that allow different features. So this is one particular file system, which is very common. If we go back to our inode, which is a data structure that stores information about each file and directory, there's one entry, 16 bits, that store an identity of the user and 16 bits that store the group ID. So that's, that's the restriction in this case. We'd need a different file system to support multiple groups. And that's where role-based access control systems become more uh, useful to represent multiple different groups, uh, not for a file but for other resources. One last demo. Uh, there's a program called STAT which shows you a. Sorry. My file. STAT shows you some information more detailed about the inode. And I'll just zoom out so we we'll see it on one line. Show again. It shows the details about this particular file. Here's the file, the size, the blocks, because actually a hard disk is made up of blocks. So we may, depending upon the block size, may use a bit more space than uh, the number of bytes. Um, it's a regular file. I'm not going through all of this detail. This is the inode number. The file system keeps track of these numbers in a, in a data structure. So this is the, the core representation of this file is stored in this inode, number 61377. We may have links between files. So we may have a real file on the disk and another file which is represented in an inode but links to the real file. 
So we don't have to store two copies of the file, we store one copy of the file and another one links to it. Similar to links you see in most operating systems. Like, yes, like a shortcut, that's the word I was looking for, like shortcuts in, in Windows. Yep. It can be a little bit more complex, but yeah, that's the concept. Links. Here are the access permissions, represented in the nice format of these uh, 9 plus 1 character. The 1 to indicate it's a, f a file, then the next 9 to indicate the permissions. The user ID, the name, Actually, most users, or all users are represented by a 16-bit number. This is just the, the textual representation. The group ID, and then those uh, times, so the timestamps. So that's the, the core information of the inode. You can see uh, in a little bit more detail than what you see when you use LS. And to finish this lecture for today, what do we miss? Special permissions we're not going to talk about, but you can explore them if you like and see what they mean, have a read through. Uh, some common Linux commands, ls and stat. df reports total file system disk usage. To change permissions, and that will be your task in your homework, you'll have to use another program called change mode. The mode is the permissions. You can change who can read and write to particular files. And there's, for the special permissions, there's some more advanced commands like list attributes and change attributes, extending beyond the capabilities that we've seen here. Enough for today, enough for this topic.